Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Van Wert, and I'm the manager of Marion County's EarthWise Network. Uh, EarthWise is a sustainability network here in Marion County that is of no charge for any of our Marion County businesses that would like to participate. We offer networking, um, webinars, events, resources, and connections to folks to help you guys really have the best sustainability in your business, for our community, for your bottom line, um, and just to really move to that trend of business can have sustainability that is viable and exciting. A little bit of history around uh, food waste and my background. Um, I am actually a trained facility facilitator for the Food Waste Stops With Me program, and it's something I'm very proud about. Um, but my background also includes working with the Oregon Food Bank Network um, and Feeding America for 16 years. The program I helped um, develop is a grocery store program called Fresh Alliance, and currently there are 385 stores across Oregon that participate. Um, in my time at the food bank, this program diverted 121 million pounds of food to those in need instead of landfills. I was really blessed with the fact that I got to also then meet with sustainable coordinators from corporate groceries and learn not just about how to do donations, but about food cost and shrink profit margins um, across the grocery store and even in their food service areas like their delis or their quick prep um, kiosks. So this is an, uh, something that's very close to my heart and I see in Marion County so many restaurants that really kind of have the eye on the prize about looking at how to do this better. Um, so if you're turning in live or you sent me a request for a link to view on demand, I'm so happy you chose to jump into this topic with us. And for those of you who have found this workshop in our YouTube playlist or from our virtual event page, I wanna welcome you um, as well. The official Foodway Stops With Me program is four hours and it's designed to be person in person and interactive in small groups. And right now with COVID re restrictions, um, we are looking to modifi modify this program. So today's webinar is going to be an overview of uh, the Food Waste Ends With Me program. And on January 20th, 2021, our event virtual event page will have all four of the roadmap sessions. There'll be 30 minute sessions. Um, that are on demand in one hour. And what we're hoping because they are so collaborative is that folks in your restaurant either view it separately or as a team, and then you guys come together to um, actually create that roadmap for yourselves. Today's agenda, we're gonna talk about um, why is food waste prevention so important? and kind of the four drivers of food waste reduction. Um, they're the big ones, they're measurement, prevention, engagement, and donation. We're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, food waste prevention roadmap, which is something that is a great tool and it's so simple. You don't need a computer, you don't need a fancy dancy program, you don't need an app. You just need some pen and paper. Um, our jump in for our basic housekeepings for you who are live on the webinar, if you think of questions, please just add them to the chat bar at the end of this presentation. We'll have plenty of time to answer questions and give resources. If you're watching this on demand or you found this on um, any of our media channels, please feel free to email me your questions and my email is at the beginning of this presentation and it will be at the end of the presentation. Um, also, if throughout this workshop or you were you're viewing it later, you're going back and thinking of it, if you have any questions that don't quite fit what we talked about, but you still 
want to have some information, please reach out to me. Um, if I don't have it, I love finding that information out. Um, and I love networking with some of our hospitality industry and chefs to really get people great information. Um, so I think the best place to start is as a community, as uh, restaurants in Marion County, there's a lot of conversation about food waste, um, either happening between restaurants, internally with chefs, um, sometimes even with our wait staff or our customers. And we're not the only ones who think that it's important. And that's a good thing. Um, every year, the National Restaurant Association surveys hundreds of chefs across the country to learn about um, culinary trends. And it's about 700 chefs that rate the importance of 161 culinary trends. In 2018, the number three trend was food waste reduction. Um, in 2019, the third most interesting trend was zero waste cooking. Um, now in 2020, most of the conversation has been focused on food waste in times of challenging openings due to COVID restriction. And I do fully expect that with all of the stress and chaos that COVID has implemented kind of in all of our lives, but especially in our restaurant communities, we are going to get some really great lessons about food waste and additional creative ways to manage it. Um, probably one of the best things that comes out of the sustainability of a restaurant and reducing food waste aside from the community and planetary values is the business case for food waste reduction. Um, and Champions, which is a restaurant marketing trend um, conglomerate, does research studies on the return of investment in food waste. And what they found um, right now for the past four years is that for every dollar invested really thoughtfully put into reducing food waste in your kitchen, you can get $7 um, of financial benefit realized. And that can be anywhere from energy savings, hauling savings, and then savings on ordering or menu planning. I wanted to share with you um, a little bit about how that works, um, food waste works, reduction works in Marion County, and some of the things we offer. And I wanted to share a little case study with you guys. And this is Capital Coffee on Court Street in Salem. Um, Frank is the owner of Capital Coffee, and he has been just a champion in food waste reduction and sharing his knowledge about food waste reduction with other chefs and other restaurants and other teams. Um, one of the things that is very important for him is making sure that as a small business, uh, the food waste really is contained. He works in the downtown area. He is really super aware of um, how food insecurity affects folks. And so he takes that philosophy that food is too good to waste. Um, so one of the things he does is he does offer sandwiches a la carte or with sides and he adjusts the sides to accommodate different appetites. He uses precise knife, knife skills in prep work and saves over 300 pounds and an estimated $950 a year in just vegetable prep, just by making sure that he is doing the correct knife cuts, he's trimming food properly, and he's looking at his trim waste to see if there is a place where he can make an adjustment. When we talk about food waste, um, there's a lot of things that go into it. And one of the things that we tend to talk about a lot 
is composting. Um, and as you guys can see, composting on our food waste hierarchy is a, down at the bottom. It's one that we're more familiar with, um, but it's not as impactful. And this is the food waste hierarchy developed by the Oregon DEQ develop, uh, Department of Environmental Quality in order to, of positive impact. So as you can see, kind of the holy grail of food waste production is source reduction, reducing the amount of food that goes unsold. Um, the techniques and practices that lead to source reduction may also be referred to as food waste prevention techniques and practices. Accomplishing food waste prevention addresses several environmental challenges. It saves you money. Still, sometimes when food is prepared but never served to customers, in some cases, the next best action we can do is feed hungry people. And this is often referred to as food rescue. Um, we can do this, for example, when we donate safe nutritional food, food to those we feed that are food insecure. And we'll cover this a little later in the workshop. The lower sections of this pyramid address the methods of recovery um, that keep waste from going into landfills. And the most for common form of that is composting, which is a good thing, uh, but it's not biggest part that as restaurants and even as home consumers, we can focus on. So today we're going to kind of focus on the, the big, most impactful ones, which is prevention and rescue. How we're going to do that is look at um, what we call the roadmap drivers. As you're working on food waste reduction, in your restaurant if you are working with Earthwise or networking with other chefs in town. The roadmap drivers are a really great way to keep you on task and really kind of create a plan that feels collaborative and feels right for your business. There is no one size fits all um, <laughs> for food waste reduction. Each restaurant is going to have their unique menu, their unique style, their food waste is going to look vastly different from others. So food waste measurement, food waste prevention. The third piece, which sometimes we forget about, getting our employees and customers engagement. You can create the best food waste reduction program on the planet. And if your staff is not using it and they're not buying into the benefits of it, if your customers aren't seeing the impact, then sometimes it just sits on a shelf and it's not a living, breathing uh, way to have a program. And then the next one we're gonna briefly touch on is leftover usable food for food donations. Um, everyone who would like this, when we send out the link, for reviewing this webinar on demand. You guys will be receiving this. This is actually the strategic roadmap. Um, and in each of the areas we cover today, you'll see one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Obviously you don't have to, one of them, a couple of them have four. You don't have to limit it to those or you don't have to add every space if you're doing this exercise with yourself or with your staff. But it's a great way to kind of do that thinking out of the box. What is it that speaks to you? What would you like to try? And doing this exercise with several other people in your restaurant is a great way to really get some good practices in because you'll have so many points of view um, your sous chef might look at this differently than your bartender. Um, if you're the person in the back who's cooking, your front staff that are taking orders and filling orders, waiting tables, they may look at this differently. If you have a catering manager or a banquet manager, also they might look at this differently. Um, The other part of that is perhaps you've also taken steps to reduce food waste. In this case, it might be helpful to actually sit down and write them out. 
um, we encourage this because oftentimes as we talk about food waste prevention, people realize that, wow, we are already doing this. We are already being proactive. And how do we build on that? Whether you have a hundred employee hotel or a three person food truck, all benefits in business come from the ability to set and achieve goals. And great goals are well-defined and focused. Um, many of you might've heard of the SMART acronym. If this is new to you, um, the SMART acronym is S, so stands for specific. So you are actually creating and drilling down to a very detailed statement, um, not a vague, we would like to reduce food waste. Um, specific, we would like to look at three ways to reduce food waste. M is for measurable. How are you going to look at your goal and know that you've met it? Uh, a is for actionable. It's something that you can put into place and not just on paper. The R is for realistic. If your goal isn't realistically achievable, what's the likelihood that it's going to be successful. And that doesn't mean don't dream big, don't plan on building from idea to idea, but start at the place that feels most manageable in your setting. And the final T is for time bound. Some people say time based. Um, if there's no time attached to a goal, then presumably you have forever to achieve it. And if you have forever to achieve it, um, sometimes it doesn't get achieved. So as you're looking at how to bring some of these goals or some of these practices into your business, make sure you're looking at that realistically and setting a time goal that works for you. Um, currently we are in December and right around the holidays and takeout and special orders. Maybe this is not to say we're going to have a uh, these done by January 2nd. Maybe it's in three months, maybe it's in six months. Um, you know your restaurant and you know your staff. So be the expert in your own space. Uh, the first driver is measurement. Um, and we're gonna talk about why it's important and options and how to track. And I, Sure, in some way or form, people have heard what gets measured gets manner, managed, and food waste prevention is no exception. In fact, in pilot tests conducted by the World Wildlife Fund in 2017, um, positive food waste reduction results in hotel properties um, skyrocketed when they did nothing more than measure and record their waste. So today we're going to talk about why measurement is important. We'll look at options for measuring wasted food and we'll explain the pen and paper tracking system that you could put to use immediately if you wanted. So tracking, why is it important? Um, throughout major studies of food waste reduction in the United States and across the world, food waste audits are considered the best impact in food waste reduction. Um, in January here in Marion County, we will begin our socially distanced food waste audits um, with our grant program recipients. And then starting in February, 2021, in-depth food waste audits will be available for other businesses to sign up with through Earthwise at no cost to Marion County residents. But why track? Knowing how much food your business is wasting and why is really the critical first step to reducing it and saving money. Tracking has several benefits. It's showing you how much food is wasted at your establishment. It sets a baseline. It gives you clues as to the food waste and how to reduce it or even present, prevent it. It's showing the progress that you make as you initiate different steps. Um, and so food waste audit, before we go into like details of tracking, let's talk a little bit about audits. Um, 
on the picture here, we have a food waste audit. Um, and in short, a food waste audit is a detailed assessment of food waste conducted once using waste collected over a period of time, perhaps a day or several days. For some folks, it's a week. And it's a proven technique for determining the scope of your waste and learning where most of your waste is coming from. Um, you'll see that we have two really key terms, uh, pre-service and post-service. The concepts of pre-service and post-service waste are important to understanding and measuring food waste and identifying opportunities. In short, your pre-service waste occurs before the food has even been served, sometimes even before it has been taken out of its bag or box or case at your establishment. Um, if you buy a case of broccoli and trim and discard the stems, those stems are your pre-service waste. Post-service waste is what you'd expect. It's the waste left over after a guest has eaten. Um, for most of you, this means food left on the plate. Um, in spots where buffets come back, post-service leftovers also apply to food that cannot be safely used again in a food service facility. Um, know that all food waste that's measured should consist of food items, organic items only. Don't let your staff, um, if you're in the middle of doing an audit, place plastic, paper, metal, non-organic items in the bins. Why is this distinction between pre and post waste so important? Because knowing the pre amount versus the post amount helps us point to the solution. For example, in pre-service, um, waste challenges are often corrected through training, recipe adjustments, purchasing, production adjustments, while post-service waste might be effectively addressed through menu and equipment changes. And there's several ways to really take a look at your food waste. So we are going to look at them and talk about their options. In measurement, there's a lot of ways to kind of get the data you need. Some of them have uh, easier steps and some of them have ch more challenging steps. The photo that we have right here is um, a, rest a restaurant in a hotel in Tigard, Oregon. Um, they have done, at the Embassy Suites, they have done an amazing job at reducing food waste in all of their restaurants and their facility and bringing the team and customers into this. Um, this is a great photo. They actually brought staff out to look at food waste and kind of talk about it. And so some of our options for measurement are waste hauler data, visual bin ob observations, composition audits, smart scales, um, and ongoing tracking with pen and paper. Um, waste haul hauler data in most cases can be free if your pickups are consistent, but that data lacks details. It might not be very accurate. You might be getting a weight and a fill point for your bin, but you're not really looking at the food in it. Um, bin observations are a great place to start where it's just looking at several times a day, having one or two people stick their head in the bin, poke around a little and make some notes. These are really though estimates. They're not likely to be consistent, but they're a great place to start. Um, the food audit, as we discussed a few minutes ago, uh, yields good usable data, but it's labor intensive and it produces a single point in time snapshot. Um, for these reasons, it's a perfect way to kick off food waste prevention programs and then also periodically verify the progress shown by daily tracking, but it's not a daily procedure. And as we said, we have some grant awardees right now in Marion County who um, will be starting their food waste audits with Earthwise and Master Recyclers, where our team will come in and do the audit for the restaurant. We're just asking them to do the collection. And then in February, other restaurants here in Marion County can sign up for slots 
for these food waste audits as starting points. Um, what the restaurants here will be asked to do is they'll be provided with um, bins with lids and a time frame of how to collect their waste. That food will be picked up. It'll be brought back um, to a spot on Marion County Public Works where our master recyclers can socially distance to weigh, identify, and uh, isolate any food that they see that they would like to create a snapshot with. The next system is called a smart scale system and it uses an electronic scale that can be linked to a tablet computer. Um, it produces the most accurate and detailed information of any system, but it does require space. It requires capital investment. And this truly may be bigger, better suited for larger establishments. If you're a team of four or five, um, investing in cloud and apps and scales, this might not be the best fit, especially since your waste can be measured in other ways with um, these snapshot methods. And then the ongoing pen and paper tracking, it's accurate, it's not as detailed, but the costs are minimal. Training on it is very easy. Um, and in most cases, ongoing pen and paper tracking is possible for any business to implement. So we're gonna take a quick look at that in a little more detail. Um, the four steps of successfully tra tracking. Um, pen and paper tracking of pre and post food, saver, food waste is one way to measure wasted food in your establishment. Uh, the first part of it is plan. Determine the areas where waste occurs in pre and where it's collected in post. Um, use what we call a bins need estimator. How many bins are you going to need in each area to make sure um, that the tracking is done? You can put a clipboard near the bins so people see that. The second part is train your staff. Inform the staff about the food waste measurement activity. Food waste prevention is not a process is a process, it's not a project. It's something that kind of gets built in to your daily prep or your daily routine. Step three, we're gonna track. Tracking is the core practice of the measurement and we'll take a look at some handouts here in a moment. And finally four, that tally up. Use your data to estimate your results. Total amount of food collected over total waste per cover. Um, sometimes if people are looking for something specific. So um, we've introduced a new menu item, how much trim is going in the bins? Are we actually creating that dish in the right way? Uh, and one of the things that often people say is having two different color bins can help your whole process out. So if people know that the yellow bins are for pre-service and the green bins are for post-service, um, it helps minimize some confusion for your staff. These sheets will also be sent out to you. So you can look at how you do a pen and paper audit by simply looking at how many bins are you filling a day? And you can identify that and then take a look at if you're not looking for something specific, you're just trying to get that general idea of waste in your restaurant. If, you know, pre-service, I have four bins of waste a day, my goal is to get it down to two bins of waste a day, then you have a baseline to start from. Um, the other one that's really great to get your staff involved is in the kitchen. If someone's going to put something in the trash, um, you can put the time initials, food type, loss of reason. Could be that it's just trim. It could be that the item was burnt or sent back. And you can do it however you want in portions, quarts, or pounds. But then you have something to really physically sit down 
and look over and see what is working and what is a challenge in your pre-service um, food. Oftentimes the best thing that I have found about whether you're doing pen or paper or food waste audit is that the engagement of your staff goes up. If you approach this in, we are all in this together and this is gonna be a great team project. This is not punitive because one of the things that oftentimes the, the trash bin shows is things that people are doing right, things that people could be easily taught or things that you could come together as a team and problem solve. All of those things are going to long-term build this system of food waste prevention for your business. And what are some of the things we learn from this? And that's a question I get a lot. So if we did a pen and paper or Rachel, we had the mass recyclers come in and do a food waste audit for us. What is it that we're really learning? And so put up, consider the tomato. Um, and this is, while this is household data and not restaurant data, um, tomatoes are kind of that tomato gate universal uh, challenge. Produce is a challenge. Trim, waste, using, cutting, storing. 31% um, of fresh tomatoes bought in use households are thrown out. That's 21 tomatoes a year per person. Um, and it was a great place for me to start because in 2019 and early 2020, in a food waste audit with Creekside Cafe and Salem Health, um, master recyclers and sous chefs began to see a trend with wasted tomatoes. And there was a high level of unusable tomatoes whole and usable tomatoes, but they were misshaped and missliced. And they were getting put into the trash in the pre-consumer audit. Um, by actually sitting down and getting a container and taking all of the tomatoes out of all of the bags, um, we isolated the tomatoes and were able to measure in weight almost a fourth of a case was discarded. Um, by doing some estimated calculations, they were losing six cases of tomatoes per month or 72 cases per year um, with an average of $1,537 um, along with the wasted food and the energy, water, and distribution of that food. Um, by working with distributors and the prep staff to utilize um, better cuts and utilize um, pieces that just weren't gonna look great on a sandwich for stock, they reduced um, their wasted tomato parts by 62%. And Salem Health is great. All of the chefs there are focused, trained, and knowledgeable in food waste production. When you have a large staff or you have new turnover, these are the things that you might think are going great. Um, and they weren't. One of the other things that we learned in this waste audit was that um, they had introduced a great new menu item that was super popular with consumers. And when we did the post-consumer waste audits, we saw hardly any of this item in the trash. People were eating it. It was the right size. People loved it. Um, but pre-consumer, we were seeing large amounts of bok choy. I mean, one bag, I think we estimated probably about $82 worth of usable bok choy in a bag. And what it was, was it was not time for you know, punitive actions or people to get right written up. It was the chefs acknowledging that um, their knowledge of how to prep bok choy was very different than the knowledge of the people who are actually getting it prepped in the morning. And so it was a teachable moment. And what came of that was not only less wasted food, but also the fact that the people that are doing the morning prep are feeling valued because people are taking the time to give them a new skill, teach them something new. So this is why we love food waste audits. Um, it's what we can see in a bag 
and how it applies to kind of the living, breathing kitchen. Um, our next part of the roadmap is prevention and talking about different ways to prevent food waste. Um, up here, I do have a link for the James Beard Impact Foundation. Um, they are doing a lot of work for restaurants with COVID, but even before that, the James Beard Impact Foundation created a wonderful online go at your own pace workshop with videos and um, resources for chefs. And it is at no cost and you can sign up and work on it. If you are a chef or you have a creative team in your kitchen, I would really encourage you to check this out. Um, I am not a chef, but when looking at it from the, the point of view of someone who loves food and, and loves how to cook it and how to create your menus and how to menu plan um, with low waste menus and creative ways to repurpose. This, this is a great thing because you have master chefs kind of sharing that knowledge with folks. And again, um, as a resource, it is great to have something out there online from such an esteemed foundation that is completely no cost to anyone who wants that education. So as I said, in January, we'll have the four actual um, workshop work along um, handouts and exercises ready that folks can bring up and either have people in your restaurant do separately and come together and talk about it. Or um, all of you sit down and watch it and do it together. They're gonna be short. They're gonna be about 30 minutes um, with the with fact that we figured they're probably gonna have 15 to 30 minutes to talk about those ideas that come from those exercises. So today we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about some specifics that we get a lot of questions from at Earthwise or waste reduction around the restaurant industry. Um, and throw in some tips in there and throwing in some fun. And one of the tips I have up is really we use leftover fruit from alcohol infusions to create ice cubes from mimosa flights. And you'll see the Bethany Public House in Portland, they make their own flavored alcohol. And then what they do is they take the alcohol all out, they take the fruit, they blend it up, and they make these fun um, cocktails. So even in food waste reduction, if you have a bar, there are ways to take some of your bar garnish and some of your bar food waste and make it a usable item. So today we're gonna to kind of talk about the ones that are super important, but sometimes hard to talk about. Um, as a cultural anthropology fanatic, I love looking at culture and why things are easy for us to talk about and why things are hard for us to talk about. Um, and in the restaurant industry where not only are you cooking to provide food to people and kind of sharing your passion and your art, but then how do you serve that in your community or your culture? There's a lot to it. And um, some of it can really work in our benefit to reduce food waste. So uh, plate size, portion control, well, this is not always a part of the conversation. I've been having a lot of phone calls about takeout management right now with um, the restrictions for COVID. So we are gonna just do a little brief piece on that. And then our prep stations. Plates matter. And I, I that sounds funny, um, but they do matter. Uh, they influence how much as staff plates are organized and portion sized. It's how does our 
customer or our consumer, look at what comes up. And, you know, I'll read Yelp reviews and I read Yelp reviews in a way that I'm always kind of trying to look at trends. And one of the things that I think is pretty common is it's sometimes people will get a great food review because their portions were massive and it was falling off the plate. And then you read some of the other food reviews and it's like the food's okay, but it's so big. Or the food was so great, but we didn't feel we got enough of it. Um, and in hindsight, it really is probably a right size portion, especially if it's a high quality protein or a high quality produce item. But the perception that it's not big can also then turn some folks off. So we're always kind of in a balance. But um, one of the great things that has come out of the Danish exploration of food waste reduction is a survey that shows that if a plate size is reduced by just 9%, the food waste off that plate can be re reduced by 25%. Um, and so when I was talking about the embassy suites in Portland, they reduced their dinner plate by one inch and they saw a 32% reduction in food wasted from consumer plates. Um, one of our food research scientists here in America, Brian Wozniak, found that um, across the board as consumers, we don't even notice when we eat portions that are 20% smaller. So by taking a plate down and filling it, um, you can reduce waste without reducing the feeling for your customer that they're not getting a value. Portion sizes. Um, this one, this is so challenging. And this is one of the ones that, you know, when I talk to folks, it, it can kind of sometimes be a conundrum. It's the, of course, wanting to offer the right size, not being wasteful, being able to um, create a portion that has really beautiful ingredients, but um, is not overflowing to the point where it's not cost effective for the restaurant. Um, and having a consumer feel satisfied or in some ways, you know, for regulars, um, a connection to their restaurant. So in the United States, we have seen the average portion size more than quadruple in the past 50 years. So that means the portion sizes are now usually eight times larger than what the USDA considers a standard serving size. And with that, um, diners have really come to expect quantity as well as quality um, when dining out. A lot of food can go to waste once you realize that maybe your eyes are bigger than your stomach um, in a restaurant, especially if there's hearty portions. Uh, in several cases across um, different culinary organizations, there's been research to sh show that even well-intentioned chefs or well-informed chefs often misinterpret portion size. So in studies across the U.S., most chefs estimate a well-thought-out well portion size that is often two to four times over a recommended serving size. Um, making the assumption that a customer expects a particular dining experience may also be causing unnecessary waste. Um, formal establishments, for example, may assume that their customers expect the bread basket at the table. However, more than not, not all of that's eaten, and then that bread is thrown away. Um, much of this waste could be avoided simply by asking customers if they would like bread or smaller single serving size at a time, because you can always refill. 
Um, often too, if people are putting other types of free pre-meal foods on the table, um, sometimes crudités, sometimes tortilla chips and salsa, um, asking if the table would like that or if they would like a por smaller portion size is a great way to start taking some of that unnecessary waste out. Um, the same can be said for sides. Um, across the studies in the United States, the top four most wasted sides are bread, chips, rice, and coleslaw. Um, so giving diners the option to have that side in the first place or giving them alternative sides um, can go a long way in reducing plate waste. Plate waste is low at fast food chains and while it's not always about quality, it's because they have a standardized um, menu and it lets consumers make their own choices when it comes to size and quality. Well, that's a little harder to do in sit down, dine in, uh, even some of our food carts, it's not impossible. Um, clarity is also the key and this is where your front of house staff can get involved and kind of run with it. Um, menus should be explicit when a portion is on the large side. Um, take an example for example, a steak for example, or a monster burger. And a lot of times we'll list those in ounces. And that's great, but that's not an intuitive measure for most people. So using descriptive words such as giant, enormous, mega burger, hangover, plate, or having your staff be, oh, that's a great choice. Just so you know, it's incredibly large. It's probably one or two meals or whatever it is just to get people to think about it. And our little thing up there, the recommended portion size for me is three ounces, which is about the size of a fist. Um, most restaurants could do a six ounce and still have a great serving size, um, but some will do it three to four times larger than the recommended size, which often leads to overconsumption or wasted food. And I do get that this is a hard balance because again, you want your plates to look vibrant and full. Um, and you want people to feel that they are getting a value for what they're paying for. Um, but as we go through this and as food waste reduction becomes more part of what you do and you share it with your customers, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit down the road, it's easier to make some of these adjustments. Um, and it is, so it really is that balance of what is eaten and what is left on a plate. and. Um, according to a study, which is RAP, and they are a group for the restaurant industry, um, more than 30% of all food waste in restaurants comes from the diner's plates. Um, this is an enormous amount that could be avoided. And it's an incredible use of funds and um, impacts to the environment that this food waste has. Um, but it's really kind of worth exploring why some diners leave food behind. There are a lot of studies about why people eat or don't eat at restaurants. And according to a study carried out by RAP, restaurant patrons are always more likely to fall into one or two categories. Those who see meals as functional and a means to refuel. So 44% of people, I'm hungry, there's a restaurant, I like their food, I'm going in to eat. And those who see meals as collective treats, um, a social occasion, that's about 55% of our diners. And it's the second group who are more likely to leave food on their plates because they see dining as an experience and as a treat, and they're more likely to order more courses. They're more likely to order something that feels indulgent or um, special to them, even though they don't know if they can finish it. Um, when it comes to not finishing the food, 20% of those meal leavers, the people who order and can't finish, um, report that their reason for not eating everything was due to the portion being 
too large and they didn't realize it. Um, they claimed it was, they were over ordering. And interestingly, 11% of people said they left food because they perceived it as a social norm to leave a little bit of food on their plate and not appear too greedy. Uh, this is where I think having a food philosophy that we're gonna talk about can really help in kind of this cultural shift with our restaurant patrons and um, food waste reduction. In fact, um, America is really um, used to kind of the idea of the doggy bag. In some countries in the in Europe, forty percent of the diners are too nervous to ask for a doggy bag. It's seen it's seen as uncouth. It's seen as um, something to draw attention to yourself. We do better at it here in the United States, but even here in the US, 55% of plate waste is not taken home. So it means that about on average, 55% of our customers are not taking that food home in a doggy bag. And the food that is, 38% of it is never eaten. Um, so if we're gonna tackle the enormous food waste problem, the stigma needs to change. Um, and it's partially about asking our servers to ask people if they would like a to-go box. Um, the other part of that is if we're thinking about the most wasted food, chips and rice and coleslaw and sides and the salad, um, if these are foods that are more likely to be thrown out at home because they don't get to them, the salad gets soggy and they don't know how to reheat the fries. And um, interesting, there's a lot of studies if you eat a standard American diet, you're not very good at repurposing rice. Um, it's a kind of eat now, not save later um, meal. So by creating a smaller portion size of things that might get taken home and wasted, um, we're kind of completing that food waste reduction around the food chain. So how do we do some of these skills? How do we talk to people about having that right size portion um, and enjoying our food for its taste and its value and not just for the opulence of being able to have so much that brag. It was, I, you know, I got the small fries and I still have a bag of them. I couldn't finish them. Um, we talked about the plate size. And again, I'm gonna go back to that. Serving food on smaller plates or in shallow bowls. Um, this might seem obvious, but human perception, very visually what we see can affect um, how we feel. And this is due to, if you see our two black dots there, one circled out, um, it's called the Del Boof illusion, where identical circles appear larger if surrounded by a smaller ring, as in um, a small dinner plate, and smaller if surrounded by a large ring, as in a large dinner plate. Um, so it's been shown that um, swapping a 24 centimeter plate for a 21 centimeter plate can reduce food waste by 20%. Um, matching your plates to your tablecloths can also help with perspective due to the Del Boeuf illusion where the continuation color stops us focusing on the size of a ring. Um, so if you have blue plates, having blue tablecloths can help folks look at their plate and not make a comparison of big or large. Um, Consider the color of the plates that your food is served in. Um, a portion served on a plate that contrasts to the color of food is seen as larger um, as the contrasting color allows you to focus on its food itself. Um, 
So, you know, if those beautiful white plates with the food, um, you're going to see the food and not the plate. Um, interestingly, and I love to throw in these little, uh, just who went and did a study on this. Um, <laughs> it has been shown that people are likely to feel they need less food if served on a plate that is red or in the red color palette, um, which makes sense because um, if you see that in fast food, most fast food uh, establishments have some combination of red, yellow, orange, which is around how we perceive hunger. Um, how do you present on your plate? So if food is shaped or plated in a square, it appears larger than a circular equivalent. Um, food placed slightly further apart um, can also look more filling without having to heap and then do the portion size. So uh, people's brains read that as well-spaced and well-portioned. Um, the size of your cutlery can even make a dis difference. Um, when we talk about embassy, embassy suites, and we've talked about them a little bit, um, not only did they go down in their dinner plates, they went down about an inch in their buffet plates, and they had no diners notice the change in that. And that was based on regulars that stayed with them uh, quite a bit. Their serving tongs went down to a smaller size. Um, and so when people were grabbing something from a salad bar, instead of having this big, huge, honking piece of uh, tong, they had a smaller, most manageable tong. And that reflected in them taking the more appropriate for them portion of food. Oh. And again, this one is one of these fun ones that I came across as we were uh, doing some research and someone had asked me and I kind of went down a rabbit hole. But music can have an effect on how we eat. So matching, if you play music, matching your music to the food you are serving increases the diner's enjoyment. So um, steady rhythms affect how quickly or slowly someone eats. So if you want people to um, kind of slow down and savor your food, your background music with a slower tempo, tempo may be more appropriate. Um, don't make your music too loud, though. There have been several studies in the restaurant industry that show eating with loud noise in the background can actually diminish a patron's enjoyment of the flavor of food. So a little food science there that's going to help us look at how to keep proportions down. Um, the last part of that is, again, your front of house staff have them ask people, you know, if a lot of food's coming back, somebody's like, I just can't finish it. And, you know, it never reheats the next day. I don't want a do doggy bag. Really listen to the staff coming back with that data. Um, like I said, we usually don't talk about material management or takeout in food waste reduction, but um, as people are adapting to uh, restrictions with COVID, I think it is a great time for us to maybe just kind of fit it in there. And so right there I have um, the condiment drawer. Many families have a condiment drawer. Um, if you never use your condiments, it's not really um, a non-food waste tactic. It's just storing it till eventually someone throws it out. Um, but 11 billion ketchup packets are sold each year. Over 855 billion single-use sauce packets are disposed each year, and that's enough to cover the entire surface of the earth. Um, these sneaky little ketchup packets seem to be everywhere. They're at the bottom of our work draw. They're the side compartment of your purse. Um, maybe your child, significant other, or someone put it in the glove compartment of your car. Um, and this is what happens when customers open their bags of food and find 12 packets of ketchup or 14 packets of salsa or nine ketchups and relish mixes. Um, they need what they need and they'll use what they need and then they toss the rest 
into the trash or in a drawer and it's forgotten. Um, and it may not seem like a big deal to the consumer, consumer, but to restaurants, every unused package that goes to waste is really a blow to the bottom line. And increasingly in challenging times and difficult financial times, we really can't afford to let these kind of products slide through our fingers. Um, Slotsky's Deli, which is a chain restaurant, um, did a study and said that their restaurants dole out more packets than customers using them. So they would offer a handful, one, one or two would suffice. And because I love research, I'm going to tell you guys, I asked um, my husband and his best friend to uh, help me conduct a social experiment. And my husband has had to help his best friend with um, some really important um, house projects that um, kind of just can't be put off. And they love um, the same two restaurants by his buddy's house. And that's usually where they will go um, every day that they're working on these house projects. And so I said, you know, can you just kind of tell me about this? And so um, eight times, so in eight weeks, once a week for eight weeks, when they went to it and they asked for ketchup, um, on the first day, they got three. On the second day, they got nine. On the third day, they got two. On the fourth day, they got eight. On the fifth day, they got six. On the uh, sixth day, they got two. On the seventh day, they got four. And on the eighth day, they had six. And they probably used two packets of ketchup between them. So as you're doing more takeout, and you're maybe really comfortable asking people, do you need straws? Do you need silverware? Um, start asking people, do they need the condiments? Don't automatically throw them in. Um, or set a limit and train your staff with that. Um, if someone asks for ketchup or whatever sauce, two. They can always ask for more. Um, if you're on a food delivery app and you have the availability to um, ask people would they like those condiments, include that in your app service and don't put those things in. Um, in some restaurants, uh, I, I could with the ranch, you know, people love their ranch. Um, so some restaurants have charged for above a set amount. So with a meal, you would get to take out containers of ranch. If you need more, we have to charge 10 cents, 5 cents, 25 cents. Um, but it is a way to be more mindful. Um, it feels like a great customer service thing to do, but if people are wasting it or um, you're putting it in and they have ketchup at home and they're taking it. it. It's just a waste and it's just a great habit for us to get into, to being comfortable of asking our consumers, um, do they want it or do they need it? One of our super secret weapons in food waste reduction are our teams. Uh, this is your staff and they, are there to help create an experience that is great for your diners. It's great for them to work in. Um, and I have found that restaurants are really supportive nurturing places when you have a tight staff. Um, your back of your house and your front of house can all be taught ways to reduce food waste. You can teach them tactics that they can easily implement. Um, you can continually do education with your chefs and your prep cooks. Um, one of the most valuable, I think, food waste reduction tactics and what I like to call the people factor in sustainability is working and teaching your staff. 
So not only are they learning food waste reduction techniques, but in those food reduction techniques, they might be learning new skills or they might be becoming part of your collaboration team. It fosters that wonderful savings and uh, money and sustainability. And it also builds up your team. And those are the folks that are probably gonna stick with you when they feel heard and appreciated and part of the solution. Um, doing some reading of chefs that are kind of those James Beard, Michelin star um, caliber folks and asking what they thought around food waste um, that was so vitally important that often gets overlooked is knife skills. And you know, people eat with their eyes. We want something to look good. We need it to be uniform to cook. Um, portioning, safety, um, all of these things. And I can't count how many times I've, I've walked into a kitchen and seen a new prep cook who's kind of been just like thrown into the, the deep end because things are busy and they're kind of lopping the tops off tomatoes and zucchinis and strawberries and carrots and the trimming from the rind of the melons and fruit is kind of haphazard and um, they're not looking at how to get the best yield from that product, let alone the amount of waste they're generating. And that trim often gets thrown in a bin, which either is composted or trashed. Um, if you've been in the restaurant industry for a long time, you have folks that have been in the industry for a long time, you can assume that cooks have the necessary skills to prep and fabricate products. In some cases, that's true. In some cases, it's not. Um, cooks, sous chefs, kitchen chefs, they should be properly trained to prep a wide variety of produce, meats, poultry, fish, and seafood. Um, it's not only about the cost of the avoidable waste, but the impact this waste has on the environment and the resources that was used to bring it into the kitchen. Um, so what can you do to help your kitchen team um, reduce the amount of avoidable food waste from trimming and cutting. Um, first one, invest in proper knife tools. Um, professional chefs often have their own sets of knives. If not, a kitchen should have a house knife or a house set that cooks can use. These should be kept sharp. They should be serviced. Um, can teach your team how to properly uh, sharpen them themselves. If a piece of equipment can do the job equally as well and faster than cutting by hand, it's also a worthwhile investment. Um, if you have a mandolin, if you have a chopper or grinder. Spot check your team's trimmings. Inspect the garbage cans, the compost bins, the prep containers. Look for the amount of food being tossed in it. Um, if usable food is spotted, that's a teachable moment. And that's where it's a place of giving someone in your kitchen staff the power to help contribute to food waste reduction. Um, pair experienced cooks with high cost items. You're, you may have several different cooks and several different levels of experience in your kitchen. And it is okay to have a chef that has great knife skills um, with filleting handle your meat. Um, if you have someone who can dice to fineness and have very little waste on that onion, let, let them be the shining star in that. Pair them with their skills um, and especially pair them with the skills on high cost items. Uh, Use your trimmings as kind of about that teachable moment again. So what is it um, in your trimmings that really is not edible? What is it in your trimmings that could be used for stock soups, sauces? Um, I'm gonna give a shout out to Taproot Cafe here in Salem. Um, they do uh, pulp 
and peels that can be dehydrated and ground. It's added to flavor of smoothies and other menu items. The last piece of this, as we talk about food waste, is realizing that all kitchens have waste. There's always going to be a finite amount of things that, um, you know, that pineapple core, that stem, that can't be used. And then we have to move it to the most appropriate next step of its life. Um, but saying, we know that there's going to be food waste. What we're looking at are the things that really are avoidable and how do we work on them together. The next tool that I think can be used right away if folks are not familiar with it is calculating um, your inventory days on hand. So inventory days on hand refers to the average number of days you hold inventory before selling it. Um, this calculation, you could do it on all of your inventory in a restaurant or do it on individual items, either popular items or high end items. Um, for example, um, if you order 180 pounds of chicken and use 30 pounds of chicken each day, the chicken on hand for you is six days. Um, so 180 pounds of chicken, uh, divide by 30 pounds of chicken equals six days of chicken on hand. Um, food items that have that higher inventory day on hand ratio that you notice are not selling quickly could indicate that the guests aren't happy with the item corresponding on the menu or that the portion size is off. Food items that have lower inventory days on hand ratio are selling quickly. This is a good time to reach out to a distributor or a vendor and negotiate better deals for these items. Uh, by paying attention to how your kitchen uses inventory on a weekly basis, you can better tell your orders with vendors to only include what you'll use in between deliveries. Um, if you're receiving a quantity-based discount, talk to your vendor about storing their product in their space and delivering it as needed. This will ensure that you are freeing up your cores and the vendor will rotate out the product so it's fresh when you receive it. Um, I have had a lot of folks who have never done um, a DOH try it with one or two items and have been really pleased with the insight that it gives folks. And again, it doesn't have to be an app or a cloud-based system. It doesn't have to be a huge spreadsheet. It can just be a picking and choosing of items on your menu that you want to really get a good control on. I wanted to talk a little bit as we've, we've kind of talked about some of these things with prevention and measuring about some kind of case studies, which are fun um, and that are happening kind of all over Oregon. And so I wanted to shout out to Raffins on Court Street in Salem. They are one of our Earthwise members. Um, they are food waste reduction machines. And one of the things that I appreciate about me and Michelle so much is that um, they are always looking at their menus, they're always looking at their consumers um, and really trying to always, pardon the pun, dive deep and find new ways to great, give a great dining experience and be very mindful of their food waste. So um, they, are, they do a pen and paper track on specials and ordering mistakes. Um, they share information with staff and with their customers to keep waste prevention in mind. Um, they're very good at communicating that they do very local high-end ingredients. And with that, they right portion it so people can enjoy that experience. Um, they buy produce local in small batches three to four times weekly, which allows them to not have waste um, on hand and being okay with if it is a special um, running out. We talked a lot about the embassy suites in uh, 
Tigard. Uh, I was actually did my training with them and it was a great, great experience to just see this whole staff that started out knowing very little about food waste reduction except for some of their chefs to having you know, catering managers and waitress um, and waiters and front desk staff and all of these different people excited about the changes they were doing. And so, like I said, um, they reduced the size of their buff buffet plates and serving utensils. Um, and they had a realization through the food waste audit that they were wasting an extreme amount of proteins at breakfast. Um, and the reason before that was because it was a buffet and people come in and you know, there's this big tray of bacon and most people love bacon and they take just the whole plate of bacon and then not eat a whole plate of bacon and it would go in the trash. Um, so they actually have a gentleman who um, is just a people person and he's lovely and he is their bacon ambassador. And what he does is um, at the breakfast service, people come up and he will put two slices of bacon or two slices of sausage on this, this little small protein plate. And people can come back as many times as they want. Um, but what they saw um, was almost in the first month that they implemented this, over a 40% um, reduction in the breakfast protein waste by just implementing that and having it be interactive and fun. Um, and that that's part of what I'd love for folks to keep in mind as you're going through this process. Um, it is about food waste. It is about environmental impacts. It is about return on investment. But the also part of it is getting our customers to enjoy your philosophy, be engaged in your philosophy and have that, you know, these are my favorite restaurants and this is why. Um, I wanted to throw in really quick what I like to call garnish gate. Um, oftentimes we use garnish as a way to decorate a plate um, and it's either edible or non-edible garnish. Um, and we had a restaurant here in Marion County that was garnishing every plate and it was the traditional parsley and the orange wedge. Um, and we wanted to look at the amount of waste that garnish itself was creating. Um, and what we realized in the post-consumer waste, so when people's trays were coming back and we just basically singled out the garnish, that's the only thing we audited, it was seven pounds on average per day, or you know, 2,520 pounds of garnish per year untouched right in the trash. Um, by removing the wasted gar garnish, it was a savings of $4,329. But more importantly, it was a massive savings in wasted food. One of the biggest concerns um, for this restaurant owner was that they'd always done it that way and people would complain that the plates looked different. So when we started taking the garnish off, we did it randomly for a week at different times. So we'd have different customers coming through. And in that week, we had not one person um, acknowledge that the garnish wasn't on the plate. So it is okay to take things off if they're not serving a purpose. And there's wonderful videos and resources on how to style a plate with the food that's going to be eaten without garnish. And folks, if you would like those resources, I will always share them with you. The next part of this is the portions. And this kind of like our plate size can sometimes be an uncomfortable place for a restaurant uh, to be. And when you look at it as keeping your portions consistent, it's about wasted food, it's about wasted money. And so, uh, the pilot study here was a restaurant that offers the clam chowder for $4 and it was 10 ounces of chowder per bowl, 40 cents an ounce. Um, however, kitchen staff often grab the wrong ladles and overfill the bowl by one ounce. 
five times each day during the lunch and dinner rush. That equals $2 a day in uncharged chowder, which doesn't seem a lot. However, it adds up to three, 730 a year if it happens every day. Uh, and while we're talking about money with that, we can also talk about food waste. So if someone is getting a clam chowder and expecting it as a starter or an appetizer and they're eating more, um, then the chance that they will waste more on their next part of the meal is good. Um, when it comes to kind of portions in the back of the house, the fast food industry, I mean, uh, however you feel about it, they have that consistency and standardizing measurements across all dishes is the way to be sure you're never over portioning or cutting back um, on unnecessarily. Um, encourage the use of scales or measuring spoons when plating. Um, they make great ones that are different colored handles. Um, train your staff to use the correct serving utensils and dishes consistently. Again, sometimes we think this is intuitive if you've worked in the restaurant business, but if people are busy, they're getting slammed. Um, people are new, people are switching stations. Um, there, there's a great opportunity for learning and there can be a chart breaking down the menu item that's helpful for the new staff. You can list exactly how much food goes with them, what spoon or ladle to use. Um, you can take pictures of your food and push it, put it up so people are looking. Is it plated correctly? All of these things in back of the house will help you with the food reduce reduction waste on a consumer's plate, but it'll also make sure that the food is going out in a consistent manner. Um, the other part of portions that I tell people to do if you have a serving station um, that's prepping something to go in the oven and I'll use for example there's a popular uh, chain sandwich chain where you go down the line and people um, put on your sandwich what you want. Oftentimes you'll see that area gets very messy so there's lettuce there's tomato and they just kind of scoop that up and put it in the trash. Um, if you have a station where you have multiple things out to do a mise en place and get food ready, train your staff to be really mindful of how much food is spilling out of that because that is literally going right in the garbage when people do the wipe down or the, you know, the kind of hand swipe to get it all down. If people are moving fast, obviously we want people to move efficiently to get to food out in a timely manner, but we also want them to be aware. And so if they have the wrong size scoop or spoon, sometimes that can even add to that wasted food coming out of a mise en place. Portions, and I love, I'm gonna talk about spaghetti. I'm gonna pick on French fries and I shouldn't because I love them. But um, as we know that French fries on a consumer's plate are often the most wasted item. They're also one of the most wasted items um, brought home in a doggy or a to-go container. Um, so we had a restaurant in a college campus in Vermont and they originally sold their French fries on that little boat that you see. Um, and they were seeing an incredible amount of waste of fries in their garbage. So what they did is they looked at creating a portion um, with a scoop. So instead of folks just grabbing some and filling the plate, they were actually using a scoop. And what they did is they even changed the packaging to that uh, paper bag. And so they reduced the French fries in the portion by 50%. So our little cone actually contains 50% less fries than that. Um, what they found after three weeks of doing spot check audits on this 
is that there was a 31 reduction in plate waste of french fries per consumer. So even though people were getting 50% less fries, there's less, there's 31% less waste. Um, and 70% of the 422 questioned said they did not notice the change in portion size. And Menu portioning to reduce waste only works if all of our employees are properly trained, if people are embracing this, and this counts both for employees in the kitchen and employees that have contact with our guests. Um, you know, charts breaking down items, lists with the amounts needed, all of these things calibrated, tools measuring spoons and cups, it makes menu portioning easier. But a really great thing to do is give your customer more options. For example, does your main meal need to come with chips or a salad? Um, give customers more choice over what to include or what to leave out. Um, side dishes or a la carte dishes can sometimes be a good fit for your restaurant. Uh, and those are things to explore and explore them with your customers and get that feedback. Our, last, our third piece is driver engagement. And so when I say driver engagement, it's how do we engage our team? How do we engage our customer? How do we engage in the activity that we want to do? Um, and what we know is that across the board, um, we have a lot of folks whose staff and team members are changing as we have younger people coming in to the workforce. Um, and right now, 64% of men, men, uh, millennials consider a company's social and environmental commitment when they decide where to work. So if you have a great policy of sustainability, you're going to attract people who are gonna to wanna to work with you on those projects. 64% um, won't take a job if the company doesn't have strong corporate social responsibility. And 83% would be more loyal to a company that helps them contribute to social and environmental issues. And by reducing food waste, we really can adjust that. The best way to share with your staff and your customers what changes you're making are to create a food philosophy, engages your customers in your commitment. It shows why sometimes you're making these changes. And this is our Embassy Suites um, bacon ambassador uh, getting ready for a breakfast there. And the Embassy Suites food philosophy is we care about the environment as much as we care about you. Help us ensure all of the delicious food we prepare for you gets eaten, not wasted. And so as they're making these changes and they're keeping that forefront in mind, um, customers are really responding to it. You don't have to have a big wordy statement. It doesn't have to be a long mission statement. It can be something that's very easily shared with staff, new staff, and customers. And so I created a little Earthwise Cafe. And this is actually a form that's available that people can use to make um, posters, uh, card tables, or even putting at the bottom of menu if they were changing it. And so I just put in the Earthwise Cafe. So the Earthwise Cafe, we are proud to collaborate with our guests and ensure the best classical dining experience, preparing foods of the best quality and variety and amounts that are abundant without being excessive, helps us ensure that our food is eaten, not wasted. And we even have a tagline, fresh food, carefully prepared, thoughtfully served. These little changes in your restaurant can help get your consumers on board with the things that you're doing in a positive and collaborative way. But let's talk about, so we're doing this, we're reducing our food waste, but we kind of have this finite amount of waste that's unusable, but maybe a finite amount of waste that is usable and we're kind of stuck what to do with it. Um, Donation is always an option. Now I'm gonna caveat that saying prepared food to donate 
um, through 501c3 feeding programs does take some thought and equipment to set up because there are certain conditions that the food has to be cooled in, distributed in, and um, notified in labels. It's not impossible, but it is something that needs to be taken on in a very thoughtful way. Um, one of the things that people talk about is would if I set up a program with my local women's shelter or um, other program and I donated food, something goes wrong. I just don't want to be on the hook for it. Um, in the United States, we have the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. It's created to organize food donation and with it, if restaurants and grocery stores donate to nonprofit organizations that are 501c3s that are feeding people in need, your liability is, mis mis uh, liability is minimized. Sorry, folks. The big thing of this is that if you are doing your due diligence on your end and then donating that product out, um, you can't be held responsible if the donation center does not handle the food properly once it has left you. Now I will say in Oregon we have amazing food rescue and food organizations that are helping people in need and none of them are as careful or if not more careful um, with how they handle food because of the vulnerable populations that they serve. And in Oregon we also have our ORS of 3890 and that is an extra one. It protects um, even when the end recipient pays for the donated food, it reduces label requirements to really um, just key in on allergens. But it does make it easier for us to start those conversations about donating with food organizations. Uh, donations get creative, El Mercado in Woodburn. Um, they kind of have a really interesting philosophy that they want to grow and um, the first thing is the corn husks and cobs you see there go and they have an animal farmer who uses them for feed. But the staff there um, often has things that are fresh prepared that they're not going to be selling and while they can't get it portioned up and out to uh, folks in need, they support their local food pantry by bringing meals to the volunteers at the food pantry as a thank you. So no food gets wasted, people helping people who help people. It's, it's a win-win situation. And there are so many ways that we can talk about donation. I wanted to really quickly though, talk about some myth busting in donation because I think this is one of the things that makes people as business owners and you know, concerned not to get anyone sick, um, hold back and there's some really time true myths that are hard to get the right information out. So we're gonna share some. And the myth is food cannot be donated if it's past its label date. Um, we're going to bust that. Just because food is nearing or past its mark date does not mean it is unsafe to eat. Even if an item does not meet all applicable quality and date labeling standards, donors and distributors can be protected. So what does that look like? Well, um, for example, if you had um, three cans left of a, or three jars left of a salad dressing that you took off your menu and they were two weeks old. Um, they were sealed, they're not busted, they're not leaking. Um, you can tell what they are. There's no problem with the container and they've been stored properly. Yes, they can be uh, donated. The tip that I want to share with everyone is before trying to start a food donation program, consult with Marion Polk Food Chair, um, Marion County Waste Reduction or Marion County Health Department. We're going to um, give you guys the kind of lowdown on what can and can't happen. Um, things that are people are looking for, things that folks can't take, or um, maybe just 
making sure that if you're donating you are to get the bill Anderson Good Samaritan Act, that you are actually working with a filed 501c3 nonprofit. And so we're coming to our end of today together and we're gonna jump into some questions. But I wanted to thank you all for taking the interest and the passion to reduce food waste, to make your staff part of the solution, to bring your customers in, and to really honor and respect the resources it takes to create food and um, create the food that you do creatively. Um, so some next steps and um, picture here, this is our shout out to um, Marissa, and I think Marissa's actually on my call right now. Um, and she is with Manila Fiesta, which is our only Filipino restaurant in Marion County, yay. Um, but what we want you guys to do with Next Steps is you know, meet with your team and get feedback on your roadmap. So when in January, the four little exercises are available, um, reach out to staff to participate that, in that. Follow up with me um, for assessments and resources, food audit support. Um, go to some of the resources we had listed, like the James Beard Foundation. I also had a link to Lean Path for knife cuts. And start talking with others in the industry. I think that is one of the best next steps. Creative problem solving for people who do it every day. And so I'm going to jump into some questions on chat and some questions I had sent to me as we kind of end our time together. But I just wanted to remind people if you would like some specific information, um, my email rvanwert at co.marion.or.us and our waste reduction page at Marion County Environmental Services, mcrecycles.net. And thank you guys so much for sharing with us. Um, and I am gonna jump into, I'm gonna put my, hold on, we lost the screen. There you go. I'm gonna put that back up so people can see. And now I'm gonna get to my chat. I promise you guys I will get there. All right. Um, So I have my first question is, uh, when will the link go out? So if you have signed up for this, you will obviously be receiving this in an email. And um, But if you want to share this or go back and review it, this will be on the Marion County virtual events page at mcrecycles.net and also on Marion County Environmental Services YouTube channel. Uh, my next question that looks like it came up was, who should we have watch this webinar or who should we have participate in the food waste um, exercises to create a roadmap? And what I say is anyone in your staff who is interested in this program has identified that they're interested in food waste, um, who is the person who wants to collaborate or gives feedback, that those are the folks that should be joining. And it, like I said, it could be your catering manager, your sous chef, your prep staff, and two of your waitresses and a bartender. Um, if you're a small kitchen, it could be the three of you sitting down. Um, like a green team, you want to bring as many people in and get as many creative ideas flowing. So when you start looking at being ready to create a roadmap, you will have kind of the most well-rounded and thoughtful piece available to you. My next question is, are food waste audits messy? Is it a little bit gross to wade through food? Um, food waste audits are 
not messy if done correctly. Um, and it's actually fascinating to really look at what makes it into the trash and why. So if you do a food waste audit with Marion County, um, what we will do is we will come to your work and identify how many bins are needed. Um, often what we do is two food waste audits. Um, so one which is the pre-consumer, what's coming out of the kitchen, and one that's post-consumer. And we do realize right now um, many of our restaurants are in takeout and that second audit um, can go on hold until people are ready and able to do that second piece. But um, what we do is we identify where we can put the bins and the dates that the restaurant would like to take the snapshot of. Um, traditionally, we use one to three days. Two is kind of the point pressure point for most restaurants because they for storage. Um, so two days before your audit, we bring the bins in with all the signage and some uh, talking points for your staff to answer any questions. Um, when the days of the food waste audit start, what we're just asking is that people are putting food waste only into those bins. If the bag gets full, they tie it up and they put the lid on it. Um, the morning of the food waste audit um, for everyone's safety and social distance, um, we would pick up your food. It would be brought back to Marion County Public Works where we can open a bay door and put down tarps that are socially distanced for our master recyclers. And then we begin the audit. So what we're doing is um, weighing each bag before it's opened uh, and assigning it a number. Then each bag goes on a tarp, it's slit open and we're very gloved up and uh, maybe a little bit food nerdy. We love looking through it. And we start opening the bags and taking pictures of the bags and noting the content of each bags. As we go through it, we might see some trends. Um, for example, you know, is, is there a lot of bread? Is um, there are large, large amounts of, you know, steamed vegetables, whatever it is. And we can drill down to then saying, okay, all the steamed vegetables we've seen in all five bags, we're going to isolate them out and weigh them so we have an exact knowledge. Or maybe as a restaurant, you're saying, hey, we just changed our menu and added this dish. Can you see how much post-consumer waste um, when you do that, if is there from that dish? We'll go ahead, we do it, we take the pictures, we encourage folks from the restaurants if you would like to come down and help or you would like to come down and just kind of watch the process and give your feedback and talk to our mass recyclers as they're giving feedback. We most would love to have you. Um, we then take that information, we do the pictures, we do the weights, and we run it through the EPA calculator on food waste. And we ask, ask some other questions about um, just practices in your building. And it gives you a roadmap of opportunities and challenges. And that's what we hope to do is really create a place where you can feel good about starting to tackle the top two or three um, concerns that come out of the audit or celebrating the fact that maybe you thought you were going to see a lot of something in these audits and you don't. So either that dish is doing better than you think, your prep staff are really on point with their cutting, you're finding other ways to repurpose that food. So the food waste audit is definitely there, but if folks would like to have some resources about doing other audits, whether it's pen or paper or simple in-house bin analysis, analysis or a daily snapshot, you can also reach out and we can send you um, some of the forms to do those as well. Uh, let's see, our next and it looks like last question is, I'm sorry, reading this. Oh, there you go. So how do you talk to customers 
about changing portions without seeming cheap. And we, we talked about this in the culture of the expectations of how people go out to eat and what they expect from different restaurants. Um, part of this is, again, if you're creating this food philosophy and you're starting to implement it in, your customers are going to give you feedback and your customers that are continue with you are going to give you feedback. Um, for example, you might do one of those mega burgers and I've seen some of them and oh my gosh, they're like half the plate and they fall off the bun and they're this, these massive but beautiful like sandwiches. And so you obviously, you know, maybe you can take that sandwich down an ounce or two and not lose the size or quantity. Or perhaps it's if we have the massive sandwich that big, we don't need nine ounces of fries. We only eat, need seven ounces of fries because they're going to be piled around this. Um, for restaurants, you can start saying, we, we don't want food to be wasted, you know. So we are doing half portions or you can have you can put on your menu, you can request, you know, smaller side dishes. All of these things, as long as you're communicating um, transparency and authenticity, your customers, especially your regulars, are going to embrace that. And they're going to give you feedback. Um, it's not a scary thing at all to say, we don't want to waste food. We want you to have a great dining experience, but we don't want to waste food in the process. And there are ways to do that where everyone wins. And as you explore it, it gets easier. So again, um, for all those that tune in, thank you so much. Um, for all of my folks that are finding our webinar in another way. I'm so glad you found us. I hope you reach out. And as I said, if you have questions around Earthwise, food waste reduction, classes, webinars, resources, or even networking with other um, restaurants here in Marion County, please feel free to reach out to me. I appreciate all the time we've spent together. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to sit down and work through this workshop. And I hope that in January, as our roadmap exercises come out and are available on the web, that you and your staff use them and share your successes with us.